Remember hovercrafts? Those futuristic floating cars can take you anywhere you want, effortlessly gliding you over land, water, and even ice. They are like something out of a science fiction movie combining the speed and agility of a car with the ability to defy gravity, capable of taking you on a journey unlike any other. When they first came out, everyone expected them to be a huge success, revolutionizing travel and the transportation industry forever. So why then did they fail so miserably? The reason might shock you. And no, that does not mean they are extinct. They still exist, but not for the reason you think. British engineer Christopher Cockrell invented the hovercraft after patenting his idea and created multiple versions in the 1950s. However, Cockrell was not the first person to think of this idea. He was the first to perfect the concept, but people had been working on these vehicles for a long time. Everyone knew we would build a hovercraft, but they weren't sure how to make it happen. Some historians argue that the idea of the hovercraft has been floating around for over a century since the 1700s. It all started in Sweden, where Emanuel Swedenborg, a scientist, came up with the fairly unusual idea of a surface effect vehicle. And yes, his name was Swedenborg. These vehicles use air pressing against the ground to create mobility, much like a hovercraft. However, this is all we know about his design. Swedenborg didn't build anything or leave any plans behind. His contributions didn't have any lasting effects on the industry, but they are worth noting. Fast forward to the 1870s when John Isaac Thornycroft began the first attempt at the modern hovercraft. He developed the concept of a boat that functioned similarly to a hovercraft. It involved being propelled through the water by an air cushion and the power of lift. But the issue? He had a lot of great ideas, but no way to make them a reality. His vision would likely have worked. It was fantastic. But this was the 1870s. Nobody had created an engine powerful enough to do everything John needed. Following this, various people attempted to build hovercrafts during the next few decades. Dogobert Muller von Thomamal created an air cushion boat that sailed through the water at incredible speeds and was almost used in the military. Even Ford joined in on the fun when they designed a prototype. None of these projects materialized though, and those that did had significant problems that rendered them completely useless. This zips us back to Dr. Christopher Cockrell, who luckily was working very hard to usher in a new age in transportation. In his Norfolk boatyard, he dedicated his mind to this challenge and founded Ripplecraft by inserting two tins, one for cat food and the other a coffee tin, inside each other and switching the connections on a hairdryer, he demonstrated that circular jets of air produce an air cushion to reduce friction and allow boats to go faster. Initially, the military was interested. As a result, he could not patent the design right away and it became top secret. Imagine working so hard to design something only to have the military swoop in and at the last second take control of everything. What an L. But, lucky for him, the military finally determined that a hovercraft was unnecessary and Christopher was allowed to work on his initial plan. The very first hovercraft was the SRN1. And we won't lie, it wasn't perfect. It had several flaws that had to be corrected. However, this was a prototype as it was the very first hovercraft. It was expected to be flawed, but it was the first right step toward a commercially viable hovercraft. Soon after though, Sir Christopher Cockrell's idea took off. But how did it work? A huge fan underneath creates an air cushion, and a skirt that surrounds the craft prevents excessive air from exiting. Because the craft is essentially going through the air rather than water, it can travel at a higher speed than a traditional boat of equivalent power. It is also capable of traveling by land and sea. The SRN2, a successor to the SRN1, was designed to transport passengers from the mainland of the United Kingdom to the Isle of Wight. The SRN6 superseded this, which is when commercial hovercraft travel truly took flight. Later, the SRN4 was added to the route, allowing vehicles to make the journey. Before the SRN6, the majority of hovercraft travel was over shorter distances, and hovercraft producers were not too pleased about this. Oh no. They had much bigger goals, which involved crossing the English Channel. After all, if they could rapidly transport a hovercraft from the UK to France, they could compete with all the big ferry companies. More than competing, they'd be able to beat the ferry companies. 
The hovercraft was, and still is, very much a British invention, and most of its commercial passenger use was confined to the United Kingdom. One of the key advantages of the hovercraft is that it is speedy and can easily cross a range of terrains. As the hovercraft's design improved, more hovercraft routes were available. The first commercial passenger route from the United Kingdom to France via hovercraft began in 1966. Being both a quick way to travel and a rather innovative idea, it was very well received by the public. Furthermore, the thought of traveling on British-made transportation appealed to patriotic British citizens. From the 1960s to the 1970s, the media perpetuated an idea of glamour surrounding hovercrafts. Articles on the hovercraft appeared in newspapers and magazines, highlighting its unique characteristics and possible applications. Hovercrafts were frequently featured in television shows and movies, contributing to the public's excitement with these extraordinary vehicles. For example, hovercrafts were featured in the thrilling 1971 James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever, as Bond is on the trail of a nefarious smuggling operation in Europe. But the golden days of hovercrafts looked like they were coming to an end because it was during this period when the first issue started to pop up. The hovercraft performed poorly on long distance journeys and it was highly unreliable and would need constant maintenance. In fact, it had to be maintained every time it docked. As a result, the hovercraft routes kept being shut down. It became clear that you probably shouldn't use a hovercraft if you needed to get somewhere quickly. Eventually, due to the tireless work of designers, the hovercraft was improved to the point that it didn't require as much maintenance. Unfortunately, the harsh realities of engineering often come in the way of pure imagination and creativity. Hovercrafts could have been better. They were extremely noisy, and rising fuel costs in the 1970s made them impossible to run and operate, especially in high winds. They were not particularly comfortable for passengers either. Passengers sometimes called them vomit comets, and each seat had a sick bag that came with it. Talk about bad PR. They also failed to transport many vehicles at once and couldn't carry nearly as many passengers as the ferry they initially ridiculed. Also, the construction of the Channel Tunnel meant that there were more comfortable and quicker methods to get there that didn't entail hopping on something entirely unpredictable. As the 2000s rolled around, they started to fade from the public mind and stopped making the Channel Crossing. The media's attention shifted to other topics and technologies, and hovercrafts were no longer a hot topic. Even so, the story of the hovercraft extends far beyond its usage as a commercial vehicle. Today, these vehicles are still employed by the military in numerous countries around the world, and they also have important rescue and research purposes. But the commercial hovercraft story is still one of failed technology. Today, if you go to the Hovercraft Museum, you can wander around a hovercraft with its huge car deck, old duty-free advertisements, and rows of vacant seats with dull brown nylon moquette and vinyl-covered headrests. This museum has the sense of a scrapyard rather than a heritage center. Rusted vehicles and other odds and ends are piled up here and there. It's currently underfunded and primarily runs on the small amount of money that comes through the door and the enthusiasm of its volunteers. The ghost ship, or should we say ghost plane, reflects a mesmerizing and groundbreaking technology that was never quite fit for use as well as a massive national attempt for a wish that never took off. These unique vehicles may not be as popular as they once were, but they will never die completely. They continue to hold a special place in the hearts of those who love them for many reasons. Hovercrafts represent a time of technological optimism, a sense of adventure and possibility, and are simply fabulous. If you think hovercraft technology is cool, wait until you see our video on how satellites are launched into space. It's truly out of this world, literally.